So I'm going to talk today about quantum computers and um, about potential ways in which they can help us achieve human level intelligence or in fact any level of intelligence. So, here's a quick outline of the talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the quantum computer itself and um, what a quantum computer is. I can't really do a talk like this without going into some of the complex scientific details of what a quantum computer actually is. So um, that will come first. And um, <clears throat> secondly, I'm going to talk about some applications of quantum computers should they be able to be realized within the next um, seven years. And then finally, I'm going to um, go a little more into the metaphysical area. And I'm going to talk about, well, what is intelligence? What does quantum mechanics have to do with anything? Quantum mechanics and the brain. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the interpretations of quantum mechanics and reality. And finally, what does quantum computing mean for the transhumanist community in general? So because I'm a scientist, I like graphs and analyzing things. So here is um, basically what um, the talk in a scientific format. So we have. First of all, quite a lot of science, which may tail off toward the end, whereas my metaphysical speculation may increase exponentially towards the end of the talk. So um, I hope you find this interesting. Okay, so first of all, what makes a quantum computer? What are the main concepts behind quantum computing, and why is it different from conventional computing? And there are three main concepts that people need to um, understand to do with quantum computing. The first one is superposition. And this means that uh, you take a classical bit, which is a zero or a one in a digital computing, and superposition is the ability of that bit to be in two states at the same time, so a mixture of the zero and a mixture of one at the same time. The second important concept is entanglement, and this is the ability of bits to talk to each other across large separations instantaneously and this is what Einstein referred to as spooky action at a distance and what happens is when two quantum systems talk to one another and then you separate them by a physical distance they're still linked no matter how far away they are this may seem to violate things like the speed of light but what you find is when you actually make measurements on it you can't transmit any information that that quantum system contains faster than the speed of light so there's no violation of any relativity there uh, but it is still a very strange phenomenon that I'll explain a little bit more about later. The third one is decoherence. And this is um, a slightly bad thing from the point of view of quantum computing because it is what destroys quantum states. And any system that has a quantum state will interact with the environment which contains lots of other quantum states and therefore the particular state you're looking at will lose its coherence over time. And the pro this uh, can actually be used to help explain things like the observer effect and macroscopic quantum problems, but we'll get onto that a little bit later. So that's the third important concept. So I talked a bit about quantum bits and how they're different from classical bits. And here's a slide to explain that. So the uh, classical bit here is either a zero or a one, and you can have a string of them, and this represents your stream of information. In the quantum case, your quantum bit can take any value between 0 and 1, so you can think of them as little arrows that sit somewhere in a mixture of 0 and 1 states. And what physicists, how physicists write this um, is we write uh, a mixture, a linear superposition of some amount of 0 plus some amount of 1. You don't need to worry about the brackets here, these brackets are just how we denote a quantum bit to um, distinguish it from a classical bit. And these come from the mathematical formalism, but I'm not going to go into that. So this is um, qubits versus classical bits. Could, could I ask a question, mm -hmm. please? I'm a little bit uncertain. Are you saying that a, a qubit can be in a state between 0 and 1, rather than both 0 and 1 at the same time? No, it's a mixture of 0 and 1. But, but uh, I mean... My, my understanding has always been that it's zero and one at the same time until you make, uh, until you collapse the waveform and measure it. Mm -hmm. 
in what sense is it a mixture? Well, it is, it is in the states 0 and 1 at the same time, but it, when you make a measurement, it's more probable that it would fall into the state so 0. So it could turn out to be a half? Uh, well, when you measure it, you yeah. measure zero half of the time and one uh, half of the time. More likely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. So it's right. a probabilistic okay. process. Okay. So what actually, what are qubits physically? What are they made of? Where do we find them in nature? There are actually lots of different ways to make qubits. And a good rule of thumb is any small system will display quantum properties. And usually any system that's cold and also isolated from the environment is a good candidate. So I'm going to talk about one particular um, um, type of qubit, which um, is a superconducting flux qubit. There are some other um, variations that you can use to make quantum systems. For example, individual atoms or ions can be manipulated by sending in photons and getting these to excite the energy levels of the atoms. And you can use, say, two energy levels in an atom to represent bits of information. You can use photons themselves to represent bits of information by, for example, passing them through a polarizing filter. You can have a horizontally polarized one and a vertically polarized one representing two bits of information. And then these, again, can be um, entangled and put into superpositions for a quantum system. You can also use nuclear spins. And if you, get, if you think of a nuclear spin um, inside the nucleus of an atom or, or, or in a molecule, it can either be in the up spin state or in the down spin state. But when these systems become quantum mechanical, again, these spin states can merge and become superpositions. So any system where you've got a small, um, a small set, set, set of energy levels can usually be used as a quantum system. I'm going to talk about one particular type, um, which I think is a promising candidate for quantum computing. And it's also the one that I work with in my research, so I'm the most familiar with. So that's what I'm going to explain in terms of that one. Okay, so what is a superconducting flux qubit? It's made from a device which is called the Josephson junction, and a superconducting flux qubit is basically just a loop of superconducting material. So here are some examples, pictures of these kind of things. So here you have a loop of metal which has been deposited on a, on a substrate, and this scale bar here reads one micrometer. So these things are quite small, but they're very large compared to what you'd normally think of as a quantum system. So an atom or something is normally what you think of. These are actually much bigger. So these are um, thousands, millions, and billions of, of this, what you normally think of large. These are lar large objects. And so what happens inside a superconductor when it becomes superconducting is that the electrons all form a single coherent state which is a bit like um, the photons in a laser beam are all in phase and coherent. And um, the reason that you can describe this system quantum mechanically is because the electrons behave as waves in this, in this situation. So that's very important because um, quantum systems are described in terms of waves and wave functions. So it's very important that your electrons are behaving in a wave-like way. And so where does the quantumness come from? Well, the electron wave obeys the quantum mechanical equations, and it, we find that we can describe the wave using these mathematical equations quite well. And the wave also exhibits the properties of superposition and entanglement that I um, talked about earlier. And the interesting thing about these systems is you can control this electron wave by applying the magnetic field to it. So the really important thing about this system is you have um, a classical way of controlling a quantum object. So classically, you apply a magnetic field to the object. You don't need a special quantum magnetic field. You just use a regular old magnetic field, and you can actually control your quantum object using that field. So that's why this is how we're actually able to control these systems. And here I've just put some examples of circuit symbols which are used to describe these. So if you see these later on in the talk, you can think of them as just being little loops of superconductor on a substrate. This, um, this cross is known as the Josephson junction, and the next slide will explain why that's important. Okay, so a little bit more about getting it to be quantum. Here is my schematic of the superconductor. 
And what a Joseph's injunction is, is it's a weak link that breaks two sections of the superconductor. So on each side, your electrons form a wave. And what happens is that these two 